Welcome to Future Explorations. I'm glad you can join us. My name is Victor Martinez, and this podcast is dedicated to the exploration of the diversity in perspectives around the concepts of change as a constant we humans need to embrace, long-term thinking as an approach for everything we should build and create, and the limits that our human nature, physiology, society, environment, and technology impose on us by their own intrinsic characteristics. It is your task and mine to identify the connections between all views, to discover the interdependence and complementarity of knowledge and ideas. In that way, we might get a clearer picture of what that sustainable future could look like and how we can design the transition to get us there. Today, I have the great pleasure to talk to Dr. Love S. Chile. Dr. Love Essie Chile is owner and technical director of Circular Waste Research and Testing Company Regenerative Waste Labs. She is a sustainable material researcher whose focus is on developing circular bioeconomy based solutions that recover value added products from organic waste. Dr. Chile is a vocal supporter of sustainability, green chemistry, and community driven science. As a person who comes from a diverse background, both personally and professionally, Dr. Chile is driven to connect people who may not usually come together in order to co-create products and services that will lead our communities into a greener and more equitable future. Dr. Chile, thank you so much. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, great. Um, so I will just uh, would like to start with a, a, an informal uh, uh, presentation introduction. Uh, where where do you got the idea of studying chemistry? What led you to the position you are? And if you can tell us a little bit, what are the uh, the super cool things you're doing uh, these days? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I decided to become a chemist um, way back in high school. I think I, I always had a passion for science. Um, I was really just interested in learning about the natural systems and trying to understand how the world worked because I was always just very confused by a lot of the things I saw around me. But my um, my interest in chemistry was sparked when I was in high school and we were a bunch of rambunctious teenagers um, and so often our science teachers would get a bit frustrated with us doing our random things in the back of the classrooms. So I remember times when um, we would grab our uh, like just random cigarette lighters, we weren't smokers, but what I really liked to do is melt gummy bears because I loved melted sugar. <laughs> Um, okay. And so you can imagine a lot of these teenagers just doing whatever they want. Our teachers would get quite exhausted with us. And so my um, high school science teacher actually allowed us free reign in the chemical cabinet. Um, so we would just like be mixing things together and seeing all these color changes and things like that. Um, I guess I should provide her this to say that high school chemistry is not very dangerous. So we weren't really playing with anything too. You read um, my mind. I was going to ask that. <laughs> Too, too critical. Um, as I, I actually realized now that a lot of it was just um, pH indicators. So we were just changing the, the acidity of things and it would change color. And that was really cool. So, or we'd see like precipitation of like solids coming out. So yeah, I was just really like fascinated by like just being able to do all this stuff, the seeing how things would change as I added different things in together. And yeah, I just really liked how um, chemistry was a very hands-on science. And so it was just like, I really liked working with my hands and doing things, but I also really enjoyed science. And so, um, yeah, and I was never a big fan of biology. I think uh, for a long time, I was like, um, I was just like, oh, biology is just, it's not a real science. It's just like a mixture of all the other sciences put together. I was like a chemist purist back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I guess that kind of shows how like um, idealistic and kind of strong-willed I was from the very beginning. Um, but yeah, so chemistry was just like my point of focus as I moved from high school into that, my undergraduate studies. Um, I remember in my first year uh, chemistry class, my professor said that chemistry was kind of like the central science and all science is kind of stemmed from chemistry, um, which was really interesting. 
And so I felt like I was really understanding like the fundamental building blocks of, um, of the world. Uh, but I'm sure anyone who's done undergraduate chemistry uh, will know that it's not as fun and easy as that first year of uh, that first lecture of the first year. But I um, persevered and keep pushing through. I just really liked the idea that I was making things. Um, just doing things in lab is just really fascinating. I was just always really interested in, yeah, and just kind of how things worked. Um, but yeah, so I just, I considered to, to do my, under, my undergraduate degree in chemistry. Um, when I left undergraduate, I was kind of tired. So I, I, I always do this after the end of an academic spell. I just take a bit of time off just to kind of steady myself and figure out what, what my next step is. But I eventually realized that I, I, I've always wanted to be a scientist. And so um, scientist is a PhD. And so I was like, okay, well, this makes sense for me to go to grad school. But I was also really just uh, passionate about the environment. So as I said, I kept, when I was younger, I kept seeing all these strange like um, social practices in the world around me, like how people just um, randomly, this, it seemed kind of overnight that everyone was obsessed with plastic water bottles and taking plastic water bottles. But to my young self, I was like, isn't it just tap water that they fill up bottles in, like, in the factory rather than the tap water that comes out of your sink at home? So it was like a lot of these different things I was just observing and being like confused and frustrated about what seemed to be just silliness. Um, and <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, I was, um, and I think the, the, the hammer in the, in the coffin perhaps uh, was when there was the, B, um, the BP Gulf of Mexico oil spill. That was just as I was uh, finishing my undergraduate and then I was just entering the workforce for the first time. And I just saw this unbelievable amount of mess entering our environment. And then I heard in a news article that they were using um, what's called surfactants to clean up the oil spill. And being a young chemist, I, I knew that surfactants don't clean anything up. They just make the oil water soluble. So the oil is still there, but it's just biologically available now because it's now salts, uh, solubilized into the, into the ocean. And so I was just like, this is ridiculous. Um, I want to do something like to help the environment. And so when I went into grad school, I found myself on a project working on sustainable plastics. Um, and so I was really excited about that because I was like, okay, I'm going to be changing the world by making new plastics. But as I continued in my academic career, I learned more and more that um, academia is not necessarily a place to change the world. It's just kind of this, its own microcosm system of people just wanting to do research um, on the uh, you know, on the best on the best days, it's just wanting to do research purely for the love of science, and on the worst days, it's wanting to do research for some sort of capitalistic or um, or individual individualistic gain. So uh, when I left graduate school, I was you know um, empowered by all the knowledge that I had I gained in that um, in that system, but I was really just wanting to continue this um, my desire to do something which is actually going to be somewhat impactful. Uh, to, you know, to really try to support the growing um, ecological movement out there. And so, yeah, so after a series of um, steps, I guess, like kind of serendipitous, which is how I met you as well, Victor, just kind of like getting myself out there and trying to learn more and more about the field, um, I started the Regenerative Waste Labs. And so this is a company which is really focused on research and science to understand how we can, um, you know, uh, create solutions to our waste problems, as well as how we can um, support the growth of the circular bioeconomy. So that's taking organic waste and converting it into biochemicals, biomaterials, and bioenergy as well. So um, utilizing waste as a as a, um, a really valuable resource to continue to um, uh, divest from fossil fuel extraction and things like that. And yeah, so um, over the last two years now, we've been building this research lab, um, really trying to embed the ethos of uh, waste reduction into the lab itself. So a lot of um, what we do is we build our own equipment, design our own test methodologies so that we can incorporate zero waste mentality. So we re repurpose a lot of waste and divert things from the landfill. We try to um, reuse and acquire um, retired equipment from other facilities. Uh, and yeah, really just try to try not to make things from new and just figure out how we can utilize the resources that we have around us to get the work that we do done. And it's been really exciting um, and challenging, but uh, I think also um, I've been able to, you know, do all the things I love, do science, um, which is embedded in action and also use my hands um, and, you know, build things from scratch and do science from scratch as well. So, yeah, so that's a bit about my pathway to becoming uh, what I call myself as a sustainable scientist or a community-centered scientist as well.
Excellent. That I, I can hear in every word the passion for you and, and, and discovery and science and, and chemistry. Um, so before before I go into into that area of waste and recycling and plastics, um, I, I, I would like just to, to make a little pause and ask, um, is, did you share with me the, the idea that chemistry is, is a bit misunderstood? People are afraid overall about chemistry. They see all these, these strange diagrams of molecules and atoms and things, and, and it has some really complicated words that even are even hard to pronounce. Um, and I said by, by my personal experience, I, I still have this trauma in, in, in my head on chemistry in, in secondary school. So I, I guess the question is, do you feel that is, is that an actual thing or is just my perception? And if so, uh, th there is anything you may say to, you know, maybe someone young or, or interested in, in, in similar things like discovery and making, but they are not considering chemistry as a possible career, th th there is anything you, you, you could tell them to, to ease their, their fears about chemistry? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think that fear of chemistry is like echoed across a huge variety of people. I think exactly like the experience that you've explained, like high school chemistry just stopped uh, so many people from pursuing that, that, you know, that course or that science. And um, yeah, I, I guess the one thing that I, I kind of came up as you were asking that question was the fact that I, um, as a young person, I was really interested in music and like music theory, um, because there's an interesting overlap between music, um, music, math and chemistry that I've kind of noticed. And this is <laughs> kind of all bubbling up as you spoke. But because when I, uh, as a music, like as a musician, you, you learn music theory, right? And it's like you, once you learn the fundamentals, like what the different, um, you know, what is a, uh, a semi-brief or a kind of remember it now because I haven't done music in so long, but you learn kind of the fundamentals of, of what, which, what the notes are, what the different lines of your, um, and like the chord prog progressions and things like that. Once you learn all those fundamentals, it opens you up to a huge world of just like so many different iterations and combinations that you can create just using like these like fundamental building blocks. And similarly with math, um, when I did a lot of music theory, I realized it's just math. Like when you're dividing your, um, you know, you're dividing your song into different, like into smaller sections, and then there's like something which repeats over time. It's like a lot of mathematical, um, a lot of mathematical uh, what's it, formulas and like equations which kind of go into music. And then similarly, what I noticed when I was learning fundamental chemistry is that once again, it's like this harmonics which come into play. It's like once you learn the building blocks, everything just repeats and iterates and it starts to build up from the very foundations into this huge universe of possibility. And so that's what I like. I, whenever I approach science, I approach it from like a really, I guess, a different perspective. So a lot of when you're like a lot of people, when they're taught science, it's very analytical. It's about deconstructing things and it's about learning all these complicated words and things like that. But when I approach science, I see it, I try to see it as a whole before breaking it, like going down into the small pieces. And I think as a kid, we do this a lot. Like we just look at the world around us and we see wow, like the, the grass is green, the sky is blue, the birds are flying on, like, it's like, it all seems very magical. And then what science does in high school is that it, it just starts to, it tears away that magic and just truncates it into very small pieces. It's like, what is methyl oxo whatever? And it's just like, it just, it becomes so complicated and confusing. But yeah, so I guess what I, the way I approach science is more like, I try my best to see see science as another way of like as, as another way of um just seeing the world like it's like it's music it's poetry it's like once we understand like the foundations we're able to really just like like just see the magic that is the universe as it kind of expands and explodes and so i really think sometimes that the way that we teach science is doing so many people a disservice because it, it just makes it so complicated and so confusing and yes the world is complicated and we'll probably talk about this when we talk about sustainability like you know, everything is connected. It's like this crazy interconnected mess of everything. And it's, and that's, and that's scary. And I think that's why the first, um, you know, rational scientists started to think, okay, we can't deal with this huge mess. Let's break it up into its small pieces. But by doing that, we've owned, like now we only see the small pieces, the small isolated spaces as like what the world is. And I really feel like when we teach science, we don't, 
we break it apart, but we don't put it back together again. Or it's in, in a way that is like inspiring and interesting to people. Yeah. Um, and so what I do a lot is I try to combine like my love of my passion for art and science and music. And I combine it all together to try to find new ways of communicating the work that I do to different people. So not sure that answered the question, but I mean, that's the yeah. way I view chemistry at least. Uh, uh, no, absolutely. The, the analogy with music is, is fascinating. I wasn't expecting that. So no, it's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And uh, I, I need to confess as well that from all the different topics, chemistry is the one that I know less. Um, but, you know, I've been, I've been trying my best to read and understand a bit more. And what fascinates me is, is that what you were saying before is, is at the very fundamental of basically everything. You know, I mean, uh, physicists need chemistry, biology needs chemistry, uh, geology needs chemistry, almost everything needs, needs chemistry in order to understand how it works, how it came to be, but also what you were saying, um, how these, these, these blocks, these fundamental blocks can also be manipulated and then we can we can create things that are not present in in nature. So, yeah, chemistry is 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 certainly fascinating. And 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 as I said, no, it's at this very fundamental level is the, the purity of the sciences. I don't know if you know that diagram um, is is also uh, funny for many reasons. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, going going into the idea of, of of change and 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 how. You know, starting from atoms and becoming molecules, um, there is a process in nature, and a process that we humans have uh, discovered, uh, invented. Let me help me then to to, to find the right words. Um, so, understanding change from this natural perspective and from that human perspective, what what is the the the, the main uh, drivers of that that change. I think it's, it's absolutely essential for us to understand the natural process um, because it's, it's related to what you were saying about waste. There is there is no waste in 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 the natural world. So why do we have waste? How how does nature make all these changes? And what have we done in order to to come up with this 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 idea of of a problem of waste? Yeah, that's a great question. And I guess um, what I was thinking about as you were speaking was this this old um, adage, I guess maybe not old, but the only two constants in life are death and taxes. Um, but <laughs> it kind of like comes up. But, you know, the only real constant in life is change. Like things are, nothing is ever static. No natural system is ever in a state of, like in a state of, in a static state. Um, you know, even when we talk about biology and medicine, like this idea of homeostasis kind of comes up and that's the most static thing that you can be where there's like a really, there's like, but it's still just like everything is in like a, a balance, but the balance is just, it's like the oscillations between the system are just really small and um, understandable and controllable. And so it's just like nothing, yeah, like nature, like everything changes in nature. Um, you know, there's no, like, there's always a flow. Everything is in flux. When I came up like this, this physical term of um, flux, which is just like when you apply the time axis to any, to anything is just like, it, if it's in flux, it's constantly moving. And so nature just is like in this constant flux. It's always moving from one state to the next. And you can, you know, it comes back to this, um, this uh, law of, or law of, um, the world, I guess one of the thermodynamic principles of the universe is that energy is never uh, created or destroyed, it only changes state from one thing to the next. And so yeah, so the natural system is always is always changing, and it's always utilizing what's around it. Um, and so yeah, I, I what I think is a challenge is that we, we as a human society, we like things to be to stay the same, because if it stays the same, then we can always predict exactly what the next day is going to be like. We can always make sure that we're always going to have food for our families. We're always going to have wealth um, generation. We're always got like everything is just going to stay the same. I believe that our modern society is built on sameness, and that's the reason why it's so fragile. Um, you know, the most robust systems are, I mean, I guess there's also a Taoist saying, I'm not sure if it's actually that love from the from Tao, but you know, it's like a an old tree which is dry it breaks easily because it's it's rigid it's 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 unable to um it's unable to 
to absorb the changes of the environment around it. But a, a young sapling, sapling is very flexible and pliable, so it will sway with the wind. It will grow around, you know, uh, around a tree trunk or something which is static in the environment. And so our current systems are so rigid and un, unable to change and also unwilling to change, which is why they're fragile and very easily broken or disrupted. Whereas natural systems are like, they have this, this region in which there's a fluctuation, which allows things like, okay, we have too much of this, we have an abundance of this thing, or maybe this other thing will come and use that abundance to keep that low. And then this other thing will, will balance it all out. So the world is in a constant balance with itself. And because of our rigid static systems, we are pushing the natural balance out of flux. And so the, 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 we just have higher extremes now. We have higher temperatures um, in the summer and lower temperatures in the winter. Places which are naturally very dry have become significantly drier. Places which are naturally wet have become significantly wetter. And so it's just like our static system is now pushing the natural flux to the extremes. And so that's why we're seeing this hugely volatile weather systems. And that's once again, creating a feedback loop of all of our, once again, rigid and static systems constantly failing because they're not able to adjust to this, 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 these larger variations in what is what, what the world is becoming. And so, yeah, so change is everywhere. And, I, and so when I think about change and I, when I think about other, like our, you know, our human systems, what I really think about is like, how can we make our systems more flexible and more robust to change? Um, so that when, you know, when there's an abundance here and a like an a lack there, that there's an, an ability for the flow to come back to where it needs to be. And it, I think the driver of change from a chemical perspective is, is, a, um, is a, another fundamental force of the universe called entropy. So entropy is a like described disorder and the universe is always tending towards entropy. And I think about this when I clean my house because I really love controlling entropy. It's like, it's like a fundamental thing that I love to do. So when you're like, when your kitchen is a, a huge mess after you've made like baked a whole bunch of cookies or whatever, it's in an entro, ent a high entropy state. Like it's everywhere, it's chaotic, everything is everywhere. But when you do the work of like putting everything together, putting everything back in its place, you now reduce entropy back down to its lowest state. But now we know that no kitchen is ever going to stay clean. No child's bedroom is ever going to stay clean. Everything tends towards chaos and tends towards entropy. And the balance in nature is just like entropy happens. Something in the system allows it come back to come back to the beginning. Then entropy happens again. And it's just like a constant cycle of trying to control entropy. And so, yes, yeah, so our rigid human systems are trying to control entropy to, but to the state where it's like, we're trying, like, we believe that entropy like is a bad thing and shouldn't exist. We shouldn't have chaotic systems. Everything should be rigid and ordered and look really nice all the time. But the more that we try to hold that back is the, 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 the more we get into the problems that we're in. That, yeah, that, that's great. I, I remember um, there is a very famous car designer uh, called Chris Bangle. He was head of uh, BMW design many, many years ago. Um, he now has his own design studio, whatever. I, that's not important. But he said something really interesting in one of his lectures. He says that the purpose of life or human endeavor, I should say, I don't remember exactly words, but he referred to human endeavor, human action, is to fight entropy. He said, our main goal in life is to fight entropy. And when I heard it and knowing a little bit about thermodynamics and entropy, I said, yes, ent entropy for me is the scariest thing after Zuckerberg is the scariest thing ever. Um, the, <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> the Zuckerberg Sorry, thing. Did you say Zuckerberg? The, my, oh, that was my pronunciation. <laughs> Facebook, Zuckerberg <laughs> is very scary, gentlemen. Uh, but after him, the scariest thing is, is entropy. Anyway, the point is, I believe that for a moment, and now you just shook me to my my foundations. So, do you do you think then that entropy is not something that we should fight, but we should somehow more kind of um, manage? Manage and work with. Like, if we understand that all of our systems will eventually tend towards a chaotic state, why? If we try to understand what that chaotic state is. And I guess this, like, it perfectly feeds back to our waste problem, right? So we start off with a chaotic state, like, which is 
all of the resources that we have in this planet have been dispersed across the planet. We fight entropy by bringing it all back into like a centralized space. Like, okay, we're going to extract all of the iron ore and bring it back to my iron refinery. And then I'm going to take that iron ore and I'm going to break it up into its segmented pieces of like, I'm not sure what, like, like a, whatever product it is that you make out of your iron ore. But then you, but then, and that's kind of the end of what we consider to be like, okay, I've controlled the entropy of my iron ore. I've now made this thing. But what people don't consider or what happens is that now you've taken that iron ore and you've sent it out there back into the chaotic state of the world, but just like in larger truncated pieces. And so what waste is, is not recognizing that entropy. You've taken it back, you've, you've controlled it. Now you've sent it back out there, but now it's just out there, but there's no natural system that's able to utilize that iron ore and bring it back into its centralized place. And that's what the recycling system is trying to do or supposed to do. So it's like, you've taken the materials to make your plastics, for example, the plastics are out there, but the recycling system is supposed to be a, an entropy control system, which brings that material back into a centralized place for us to be able to do that again. But what, but nothing is really designed to, to be an entrop entropic system like that. It's only designed in one way to bring the ore back into a centralized place. But once you've done that centralized activity, it's out there again, but it's like, oh, that like that, that 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 second level of entropy that we've created is not managed in any like any efficient way. And so now the materials are just out there. But we but because we don't can like we don't really see that as a valuable material to then bring back through our like through our systems, we're now like at this point we're like, oh, all of the material is gone from the environment. And like I don't I have to like dig deeper. I have to go further to try to to, you know, to try to find where that where the entropic um, materials are and bring them back again, but not recognizing that it's it's still there. It's just we've created into denser, larger pieces, but we have to now create a, a human made system to bring that material back so that we can continue to circulate it again. And that's essentially the foundations of, um, of the circular economy is like to try to create a human made system that's supposed to control that entropy and bring it back to a centralized state again. And yeah, so by understanding that everything tends towards chaos, understanding how that chaos unfolds and then creating systems to to uh, to um, to benefit from that chaos is kind of how we create a a, a system which emulates uh, natural systems, at least in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I I, I completely agree. It co makes complete sense. Um, I, I'll be hopefully talking in a few weeks to uh, an ecological economist, and and that's where we will will bring some of these concepts into into a bit more uh, grounded. Um, I, I have read about that, and uh, there is a very interesting way of, of um, assigning value in a different way to things according to the entropy generated and the amount of energy that has been used in order to create something. It's, it's called embedded energy. So I, I, won't, I won't go there, but I think it makes complete sense to what, what, what you were saying, but you put it in a different way that I, 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 I never heard before and makes, uh, to me, makes complete sense. So if I understood correctly, you know, this, this uh, I, I guess we're missing the idea that uh, these this, um, um, extremes or this, uh, uh, you were talking about nature, that nothing is static, that is always in, in, in flux. In flux. Um, this flux is also non-linear, no, it's, 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 it, it goes in cycles. So that, that brings, again, from chemistry to biology, this, this idea that, uh, you know, the, 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 what we could maybe consider waste from one organism is actually the food for another organism. And the, the, in, in nature, the, the cycle is completely closed. It's this idea of managing the entropy that, that you know, just goes around and, and is it's being managed and used. Um, and then, therefore, I guess we can say that some, if not all, of the the the, uh, the systems, and in the case of, of chemistry, I, I imagine materials, compounds that we have created, uh, they lack that that bit. No, they lack that that extra step of managing that entropy and saying, okay, how are we? Who or how is going to break down that uh, and bring it back to a, a, a flux? Um, understanding that um, for every change there is a required for energy. You now we've been talking about work, but work is is a is a is a form of energy. 
uh, or it's another word for energy. Um, so, uh, would you agree that that's some of the reasons why we we've, we've been creating waste as humans that we have missed the 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 need for for that kind of closing loop? Definitely, yeah. And I feel like in industry, like kind of behind the public eye there are much more closed loops than like the general public recognizes, you know, because for example, let's think about um, just the, this oil refinery industry in general. Like, so you, they take oil, they make petroleum or gasoline or, or energy source, but the byproducts of that process are now being, uh, being fed into the plastics industry because without like, you know, the, um, What's interesting is like the, the oil and gas industry is lose is no longer making a huge amount of profit on gasoline and oil. Then the most the bulk of their um, their revenue comes from plastic generation, which used to be just a byproduct of their oil production, but now is like their main um, their main source of revenue. And as we transition to more and more renewable energy, like the plastic oil and gas industry is relying on plastics um, uh, production to to maintain their profit margins. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so, but within that established industry, the oil and gas industry is about 100 to 200 years old. Over that time period, they've been able to completely utilize every single aspect of that material that they're extracting, be it plastics, be it solvents, be it, um, you know, additives to, for plastics and, and, or chemicals and things like that. That industry is in, incredibly robust and incredibly closed loop and circular um, until it kind of, until it, enters the public or the um you know into the, the general society and that's where it kind of like starts to just um just break down and so industry is already doing this but they don't necessarily consider it to be circular economy this they consider it to be good business and that's where the opportunity really is with regards to the circular economy in general um taking what is already done in industry and then extrapolating that 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 out into the public sphere but also taking biomass and being able to biorefine things with such um, with the same amount of um, robustness and uh, into integrated um, into integrated manufacturing to be able to do the same thing, but from a starting material which is somewhat more renewable and somewhat more benign to the environment. And so, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I I am also a big history fan, and so I take a really I take a good look back and see. The pathway that it took for us to get here and all of the sociological political um yep. uh, and, and economic reasons to kind of be in this space and what's really frustrating i guess to me is that um you know the oil and gas industry has been given that 100 to 200 years to do that amount of refining but now when we look at sustainable alternatives like the bio like the general bioeconomy we're not being given the same amount of time and but we're being held to the same expectations as a very old system, but to a system which is only between like, you know, 10 and 50 years old. And so it's that, it's that dichotomy is, which is frustrating to me or that a lack of understanding that things take time to be yeah. able to fully connect a system to make it more sustainable. And so, but I understand the challenges that we face today where we're, we're desperate for things to change and for things to get better. And we just don't have any time to really like to wait around, but it is a challenging thing. But it's also a thing that industry has been doing for a long time because, as I said, it just makes good sense, business sense, to, to be able to utilize all of the different products of your process so that you can maximize your revenue streams. Yeah, it's, it's maximizing uh, as much as possible the resources you have to extract the maximum profit, which obviously makes sense from that, from that economic perspective, absolutely. Um, but again, it's this idea of reductionist uh, thought, no? that mm -hmm. we should focus in this specific point without really understanding the consequences. Um, maybe my, there, is, there is quite some amount of evidence showing that they knew many, many of these things, but made no economic sense, so why bother? Um, so going going down now into into, into the, the, your field, this uh, plastic and, and the work that you do in your lab, um, I guess the, the first thing that I would like to, to start, you know, again, thinking of an, uh, in, in our audience is to understand the differences between uh, recycling, uh, this term upcycling that uh, is being catching on a lot in the last, in the last couple of years. Um, and obviously there is this other, you know, every time they come up with a new R, uh, repurposing and re something else. 
So what, what would you say is, is the main differences between you know, repurposing, recycling, uh, upcycling, and so on? Yeah, I guess um, the main difference is the, what's I'm looking for? the level of deconstruction of the product and that's probably confusing <laughs> but so chemistry is the study of atoms and atoms come together to form uh, molecular compounds and those compounds can come together to form a variety of different things on top of that be it like fibers films um proteins organisms human beings uh, and entire ecological systems so the, every single thing that's created in this world today is made up of small atoms, essentially. And so when we look at the, I think it's now seven R's, um, but let's just break it down to like, you know, recycling, repurposing, um, and reusing. Let's just use those three, three things for now. Yes. So when we reuse something, like for example, a plastic bottle. So we have a plastic bottle, we, like we, we buy it, we drink whatever was inside, Maybe we refill it with water from the tank, uh, from our tap, and we reuse that plastic bottle as much as we can until maybe for some reason it becomes a crack or a hole that starts to leak. So that's reuse. And so we're not actually changing, like we're not breaking it down. We're not disassembling it. We're just reusing that product as it is. And when we go to, and that's, I guess that's similar to repurposing because uh, maybe instead of using that, if that plastic bottle breaks, uh, like there's a crack in the top, we maybe cut it in half and use it as a cup you know, that would be repurposing. So that's a bit of disassembly. So we've like, we've broken apart a bit, the top part we no longer necessarily need or we could find a use for it, but the bottom part is now like this lovely little cup that we can use. So that's repurposing. Um, if, we if we take something a bit more complicated, like a cell phone, for example, the cell phone um, is made up of multiple parts. There's the, there's, I guess there's no longer little keys, but there's like the screen, there's the camera, um, there's probably a microphone in there. So when we think about um, also repurposing, we could, we could break that cell phone apart to its const, const, constituent pieces, and we could take that microphone, we could put it into something else. We could take the little camera, we could put it into something else. We could take the screen and put it into something else. So now we're, we're, de, um, we're destructing that, um, that, that product and using its component pieces in different places. And so that would be, I guess, um, yeah, deconstruction. Uh, it could also be repurposing, like it kind of falls under that umbrella. When we take another step down, we're now looking at, okay, so what are the materials that go into that phone? For example, the lens is made up of silicon for the actual lens piece. It's got maybe copper in it. It's got different types of metals and plastics. We start to break things down to its molecules and it's like um, components, it's atoms, for example, that's where recycling comes into play. When recycling is at the very bottom of that, that entire spectrum, we're now breaking it down to its fundamental component um, uh, chemical pieces, and we're trying to utilize those pieces again. And so we're just looking at the spectrum of a, of a product from like it's, it's how it was initially made all the way down to the components it was used. And we're trying to find ways to reutilize those different materials and components in other systems. And that's very similar to what happens in nature as well. Yeah, yeah, clear, absolutely. The the idea then of upcycling and downcycling comes from yes. from the limits of this recycling process of the different different materials. Exactly. Yeah. So, for example, like um, let's talk about down downcycling first, because maybe it's the easiest thing to understand. So, you have a plastic bottle. Your plastic bottle can be like it can be ground down into little plastic pieces. Those plastic pieces can be melted and remade into a bottle sometimes. Um, so the more that you do that mechanical processing, the more, it, um, the more it weakens the actual component materials that you're putting together again. And so the weaker it is, the less able it is to actually become a bottle. So that it has to come down a step to become something like a fiber. So it's like, oh, we can't make super long chains, but we can make very short chains um, of, the, of the plastic uh, molecule. So if we're making shorter change, it's not as strong, but maybe instead of using it for a bottle, we can use it for this other application. But that other application is not always um, as high value. So you can't sell that product for as much money as you could that plastic bottle. And so the more that we go through this recycling process, at least this mechanical recycling process that I've explained, like the grinding of things down, the less that, the less that you can use that material for. So eventually, everything becomes waste because it can no longer be used uh, again. 
Whereas in an upcycling fashion, you can break it down uh, so it can be used in the same application or something which is higher value. So if you break it, like if your plastic bottle can be broken down into, I'm not sure what's higher value than the plastic bottle, probably a lot of things. Like for example, if this is not actually possible, to, but if you could use your recycled plastic bottle to make, for example, like a heart valve or to make um, a, a screw for your bone, like in, in a biomedical application, like that would be something which is higher value because you can sell that product for more money than the initial material that you've been using. Uh, that's not actually possible with a plastic bottle, but that's just an example that we can use. And so depending on the different like recycling process that could either, that will either produce a material that's lower value or it could produce material that's higher value. For example, uh, um, and metals are a, a good example of a, of a, a material that can be upcycled and yes. has no loss of value and we can keep going on and on forever. Yes, and that's really, and that, that's where chemistry comes to play again, I guess, because it comes down to the chemical composition and characteristics of that material itself. Metals can be melted and remolded pretty much infinity times, um, but plastics are the same as metals. Uh, and so they, ca they can't be recycled the same amount of times. That is the perfect cue for the next, uh, the next idea in, in, in the episode, which is the long-term thinking. Um, and precisely, you know, it's, it's a bit, um, quite a bit uh, philosophical, this approach, but knowing that eventually in long-term, I, I don't know if we could even estimate uh, at some point how many years, or hundreds of years, basically all the plastic that we have produced is going to be completely useless. It will become complete waste, all of it. I, I don't know, maybe it will be, I don't know, 200 years from now, maybe less. That would be interesting if you, if you have an idea, more or less. If someone has uh, made the calculations for that, I, I haven't seen or searched uh, for that. But the, the, the main logic is that no matter what, that will happen. All the plastic is going to become waste uh, sooner or later. Um, should we, this is a complicated question, should we even try? Should, I, I know that there is then the economics of the benefits that, that we are getting immediately against the, the price or the cost of what is going to happen with all that plastic in the future, which, I mean, we already have some severe problems of plastic waste, especially, especially in the oceans, as far as I know. Um, but again, thinking about these long-term, what, what will be the, 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 <laughs> what will be the ideal mechanics of chemistry in the sense of what we should be doing and we shouldn't be doing, should not be doing? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting and yes, complicated question, I guess. Um, let me think how to answer it. To me, if we go all the way back down to the fundamental thermodynamics of nature, um, the th thermodynamic principles, I guess, um, as I mentioned previously, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred um, from one state to the next. And so I don't necessarily, and waste only exists if there's a system that cannot utilize that material. And I think what really, what frightens me or the challenge that I see in the future when it comes to plastic waste is that at a certain point, the material is going to be so entropically disordered and chaotic uh, and, and dispersed in our natural environment that we won't be able to pull it back in uh, into a centralized um, spot uh, um, space again. So what I mean by that is, so no matter, for example, if a plastic bottle has been floating in the ocean for 50 years and there are things which have been found in the ocean which have been floating around for 50 years, yeah. that's if there is, there are chemical processes that you could do to take that plastic back to a virgin state. And by virgin, I mean back so it's, it looks, so it's in the exact same state as if we had just taken it from the earth and processed it. The challenge is, is like, is the microplastics and the nanoplastics. So the plastics, which are so small that they're not able to be captured and brought back for us to utilize again. And the challenge of our current system is that the, the additives that we add to plastics to make it clear, to make it food safe, to make it malleable, to make it uh, um, long lasting, the additives that we add to it are often toxic and they stick to the plastic. So when your plastic breaks down to a microplastic in the environment, 
it's not the plastic itself that is the problem. It's the additives that it carries into the environment with it. And so when it's in the environment in it's nano or microplastic form, it's starting to leach out those chemical compounds into the environment, causing ecological damage because we were I'm even sure about the impacts of some of these additives on the natural systems. So if we're, what I really see as an interesting opportunity is, is, is to take the plastics that we sequester from the ocean, find mechanisms to chemically recycle them back down to their base components to be utilized again back into our systems. And because plastics don't have to go just to plastics, you can break down plastics to make things like um, jet fuel, to make things like uh, petroleum and gasoline. So if we're able to find and um, invest in systems that are able to capture that plastic from the environment, bring it back and then transform it into something that can, can still could be considered useful within our economic system, I see that to be a huge opportunity. But what um, concerns me is the plastics that we're not able to see or capture because they're already in the environment and they're already making an, an, an ecological impact. But when I think about the grand scheme of the, the, the earth, I pretty much, um, I try to, I, I try, it makes me feel good to think outside of human um, time scales, because it's like human society has been around on this planet, I think maybe between 12 and 20,000 years, um, depending on when you consider humans to be humans, I guess. Um, but before that, the earth exists, and after that, the earth will continue to exist. And so eventually, uh, natural ecological systems like microbes and bacteria will find a way to consume this abundant resource because that's what nature does. It doesn't leave anything for waste. There have already been bacteria and microbes found in landfills which have been shown to be consuming plastic waste. And so, you know, evolution is happening to incorporate that human-made material into its natural systems. The real challenge that we face is like us as a human society, will we be around to reap the benefits of natural ecological transformation over time? And so I'm, of, I'm always of two minds, I guess like any young person, millennial, or just any like um, thinking human, per, uh, the pendulum swings between a doomer, oh my gosh, everything is going to be terrible, and a bloomer, like we have the opportunity to really make a change and, and to, to you know, find ways to get us out of the system. Um, and so some days on both, some days on, on one side or the other extreme. But today I'm a bloomer and I do believe that if we are uh, motivated enough to actually create the, like, the economic and political systems to, um, to support the extraction of plastic waste from the environment back into, from that um, entropic system back into a controlled uh, centralized system for it to be utilized again, it you know, maybe not all of it, but maybe we could try to isolate at least 50 to 60 percent of that material to be used um, and to be, to be used again. And I guess I'm not sure if I answered the question, but that's what I kind of feel about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. But now uh, uh, you, you, you brought some some more questions to my head. And, and here is the, the deeply ignorant chemist in me. Um, so you, you were saying that we could actually bring down the, these plastics to their, their original uh, molecules. Yes. Um, so then, uh, but basically what, what I'm, I'm, I, I have lived so far until now thinking that once has become plastic and has been reused and recycled a few times, what we, just, we, we were just saying, it, basically we can't do anything else with it. But you're saying that, yeah, we could, we could take these plastics and bring it down back to, to their molecules and do all the things with those molecules. So why are we not doing that? Why are we burying in landfills all this, this huge amount of plastics? Yeah, I guess it all comes down to dollars and cents. I don't know where I heard that, but that's pretty much how it ends up being. First, it's, it's incredibly challenging to actually isolate and bring that material back from the, like, from the, vast quantities of ocean where it's currently in. Secondly, it's economically intensive to create the technologies to actually do that recycling, um, to, to, to implement this recycling, these recycling processes at a large scale. And finally, because we have virgin materials coming out of the ground, which are being subsidized by, um, by governments across the world, there's no economic driver for recycled plastics or materials to actually be able to compete with what's coming, what's being directly extracted from the ground. And one of the biggest things, which is, um, you know, which is a roadblock to actual sustainable um, 
to real sustainable development is the amount of subsidies and uh, funding that's actually given to these extractive technologies um, on a wild scale. And there's a huge reason why this system is like this cyclical system of lobbyists, government subsidies um, and economic uh, benefits kind of goes round and round and round and why it's really difficult to break into that system. But essentially the technology is already existing and if it's not already existing at scale, it could be very easily scaled up. The challenge is even if we were to invest in the um, in the collection of the plastics and the building of the infrastructure, when we actually try to sell that recycled material into the marketplace, it will be more expensive than the virgin material that's being dug out of the ground today. And that's the real challenge. That's the real problem. It's just like if there's no economic driver for those systems to be implement, implemented uh, today. And there's a, a huge variety of reasons as to why that system is, is being upheld by the people in power and also by the large, uh, the people who benefit from it as well. Yes, yes, I, I should have imagined that the, the, the bottom reason is an economic one. So what I understand from what you were saying is that we understand how to do it. We don't have the technology to do it. And there is no um, economic incentive to develop that technology and the whole systems to actually do it. Um, we have the technology, I, it's just not at scale. At like, scale, yes. Yeah. Yes, at scale. That yeah, yeah, correct. That's what I meant. Um, similar, I guess, with with bacteria because I have heard before for quite a long time now that there are bacteria, okay. enzymes, and so on that can also process and break down these or at least some plastics. Um, but again, uh, the knowledge is there, the technology is there, but is is not feasible at scale. Mm -hmm. I imagine exactly, and that's really because all of the technologies you have to like if the only way they compete with the only way a recycled resin or plastic can compete with a virgin material is if no labor, no technology, and no money has been spent to make that recycled material. Because you have to, there's, there's always labor costs involved in any process, but the second there's any additional um, expenses that are required to be paid for that material, the economics of this completely get thrown out the door. And because the only people who are able to do those recycling systems are the people who make other plastics producers. But as I said, the plastics industry is directly coupled to oil and gas extraction because the plastics starting materials are the byproducts of that oil and gas, gas production. So there's no, like, un, like, yeah, unless we completely stop oil and gas production, which completely kills the plastics industry, there's no reason or there's no economic incentive for the plastic industry to invest in these recycling technologies. But that there's, is changing slowly over time. Yeah. But it's definitely, it's being held back because they want to, they, <clears throat> this is maybe a little bit of anti-capitalist propaganda, but they do want to make as much profit as they yeah. can before they're forced to change their system entirely. Yeah, for sure. No, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll be chatting with uh, experts from other fields. I'm, 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 now trying to, 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 to get an, an economist to come and talk to us and a philosopher and a psychologist because I really need to understand tons of different things. But this is great because this is, this is letting us see how everything is interconnected. No, if, if you don't have the economics and you don't have the, 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 if you want moral or ethical incentives as well, or maybe not incentives is not the word, is, is like framework. Um, then all the knowledge that you may have from biology and chemistry um, are, are just there, not doing really their job. And, and that's, that's terrible, you know? Um, so that's, that's the whole idea of, of, of these explorations, to, to try and really understand uh, all the things that are not connected and that, that, that we need to uh, urgently start putting, putting together. Um, so now, what, what are the uh, amazing things that you're doing in your lab then? Because it's all about waste. No, what, what the name of the lab is actually regenerative no. waste labs. Yeah. So exactly. this idea that we can, I guess exactly what we're talking about. Regeneration just really means how can we take what's in the environment and circle it back around, 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 around again, but not just in a circular economy, because a circular economy in the way that it's talked about is very, it doesn't necessarily fully encapsulate or comprehend the complexities of the problem that we face. So in a re in regenerative systems, it's not just about it's not just about like one process leads to the next to the next to the next. It's also about how those processes 
enrich and add to the environment that in which they're operating. So when we talk about regeneration and the reason I named the lab regenerative waste labs is just because we don't just want to take one waste from one place to another, but we wanna find ways to make that waste add value to not just our economic systems, but our ecological systems as well. And so, yeah, we do a lot of things at the waste labs. I feel like we, we don't really have a well-defined direction just yet because we're waiting to see how our, how our research supports the industry to evolve. And so, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, I'm trying to create a business which is not rigid and stuck in one specific space, but is able to be malleable and to kind of uh, change directions as other things come to light. And I think that's, that's kind of probably the description of any startup where we're trying to just chase where the opportunities are. But I, I tried my best to also in, um, to add that sense, those, those values uh, into the culture that we that we create in our team as well. So it's just, yeah, like we're we're not, I'm not stuck in my understanding of the way the system is. If new information comes to light, then we should change the way that we approach the entire, the entire, uh, all the work that we do. But yeah, so we take, uh, we have three main pillars of the work that we do. We do um, testing, research, and education advocacy. So in our testing, we're really interested in supporting businesses to understand how can they make more sustainable products? Like how can they make products that can be composted or can be biodegraded into different controlled systems? And also how can they make products from um, materials, like from waste materials as well? So we're helping people to design their products with the, with the end in mind. So we have um, our begin at the end consultation. So it's like if we start at the end, we can think about how that product will feed back into the system again. And we also have our above and beyond testing. So you know, we want companies to go above and beyond, not just to not just to toe the line, but to you know push the boundaries to really go ahead and think about how can we make a truly sustainable product. And so that's uh, that, that's how we a, we strive to support um, businesses who are wanting to make products in a sustainable fashion. We also do a lot of research. Now, research is centered around circular waste management. So recognizing, as we've said. When a product leaves the user, it, start, it, it gets thrown into the universe again, like this, this entropic system. And so we're trying to create technologies that are able to support the, um, support the user to bring that value back into a centralized form. And so we're developing on-site waste management technologies that are able to take bio-based materials to break them down into value-added products again so that, that they can feed back into the economic cycle as a feedstock. Um, and so that's an ongoing stream of research that we're really excited about. And finally, we have our education advocacy. So, you know, we, there's a lot of mis misunderstandings and, um, and gaps in knowledge within the, within the circular bioeconomy, bioeconomy, circular economy space. And so we really try to, we do a lot of research and we generate a lot of knowledge. And so we, I believe it's really important and foundational for us to translate that knowledge, both in educational um, as educational resources, but also as resources for policymakers, and um, and that will allow us to advocate for a changing in the way that we that we view the system that we are creating around ourselves. And so, yeah, so a lot of the crux that we do, we do a lot of research, and we understand um, we reach out to the marketplace and try to understand what are the trends that are happening out there. And we translate that to um, into resources for people to come and learn more about how they can be more sustainable in their business practices and in their understanding of how they use materials. And we also use that to advocate for a, a, for the way um, to change the system from something which is very rigid and um, fragile to something which is much more flexible and resilient. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. No. It's it's I I I've been, I have had the honor of being in your lab and 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 seeing some of the stuff that you do and. <laughs> And it's pretty impressive and and the success and the growth that you have had you no know, hiring more people and it's just wonderful it's super exciting so yeah you know, it's, it's, it's really great the work that you guys do um just then moving now uh, moving then to the final section of of the of this uh, episode uh the, the third topic is limits um and i'm bringing this up because I don't know, understanding what you were you know we've been discussing our chemistry and cycles um, it's clear that the, 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 the key word are precisely the cycles and seeing things, uh, this idea of managing entropy and going around. So um, 
probably the limits in this aspect goes more towards the the uh, the behaviors or whatever factors uh, that break those those um, cycles. Um, so, from from your perspective as a chemist and and your your uh, obviously your expertise in in um, waste and uh, management and cycles and entropy and complexity and so on. What, what would be the limit that you think we, we should really need to be aware of? Big picture. Small yeah, picture. Big, big, big question, big question, big picture. Um, that's an interesting one. I am just like, it just reminds me of a conversation I had with my partner the other day um, where she mentioned we're often limited by what we can imagine for ourselves, um, which I'm not sure <laughs> is if it pertains to this, but I find that, like, I guess there's two sides to a limit. Like what, where, like, where is the boundary for, where's the boundary for ourselves? Like, where should we not, like, where should we, what is, where's the boundary between what we should and shouldn't explore, what we should and shouldn't do, but also where is the boundary that limits what we can imagine for ourselves as well. And so I think about it two different ways. And I think I'll talk about the latter before I talk, talk about the former, because one of the, the, um, one of the limits that I see for myself, like being, I guess, taking a step back to, back to my, my foundation as a chemist or just a general nerd, I'm a big fan of um, science fiction. Um, and I, and I, I, I fundamentally believe that fiction uh, informs like reality and reality inform fic informs fiction as well. And so what's really interesting to me is that the stories that we tell ourselves as, as our culture and as, and, and as a society, and you may see like the, this, this emergence of things like there's lots of dystopic TV shows and movies these days. There's lots of um, like these movies and TV shows about zombies and like the inability to control ourselves and like and control our fate, which is really interesting. And so I'm a big fan of this, uh, this new genre or emerging genre, genre called solar punk which is like this, um, this idea where we can try to imagine a future where we don't succumb to the challenges of today, but we find a way to empower ourselves with technology and knowledge and community and collaboration to think outside of the box that we're currently constrained by to create solutions um, to, these, to these grand challenges that we face. And so there's one limit, that's the one limit that I believe, like we're, we're limiting ourselves by not, by by believing that we can't get out of this problem. And I want to be able to really just encourage everyone to imagine like without, if we, if we completely are unlimited by like, by what we think is possible, how can we imagine, like what future do we imagine for ourselves? And if we're able to imagine that future, now we can work backwards to, to make the steps to get there. But with regards to like, what is the limit from what we should be exploring. I mean, there's lots of things we can talk about. We could talk about things like artificial intelligence, which is slowly becoming more and more terrifying. We can talk about runaway, runaway capitalism um, uh, uh, and like um, this, this, this interesting transition to more corporate overlords than national bodies and things like that. Yeah. Like there's lots of things um, which are mildly terrifying today, but could become extremely terrifying as we kind of, um, as we, as we um, go in that direction. But I feel like those limits are because we're, we're bounded by what we currently are thinking that the, that the world is like, oh, we, we can't think outside of a world where capitalism is the dominant, dominant economic system. We can't think outside of a world where nation states are the dominant governance systems. So it's like if we are able to sidestep all of that, um, our current framing for how we view the world and think about, okay, if all of that didn't exist, what, what is actually the future that we're wanting to strive for? And if we can find the strength within ourselves to, to make that change, to, to, to reframe the way that we actually are envisioning a future for ourselves, like maybe it's more in decentralized, smaller communities, um, which are, which are self-government, self-government, but able, uh, but able to trade and communicate with other communities around themselves. Maybe it is in, um, you know, a purely green economy, which is like utilizing organic material um, that comes as a, as a byproduct from food production as it's as the inputs for um, biomaterials, biochemistry and bio um, and bioenergy. 
So like there's so much that we could imagine. And I think we're limited by the constraints of our current, um, our current cultural viewpoint. Um, and I'm concerned that if we're only framing things within our current context and we look forward, then I want to limit things from like from, from exploitation and um, yeah, exploitation and inequity is like where I place the bounds of what I think our current system should be going towards. Like that's, you know, if we're able to create a world where people, it's not, um, it's not equal, but it's equitable, where people are able to transition from a state of um, impoverishment into a state of more, um, of, 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 of more resources allocated to them and, and, you know, be able to provide and support their families. So that's really where I think about limits. It's like this two, it's this two different framings, the limits of like what our current system should be allowed, allowed to do, but also limits to how we can, you know, breaking the part, breaking from those limits to think about what is actually possible for our system as well. That that was an amazing, beautiful answer. Really, <laughs> really inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, so just to close now, I have the last three questions that I've been asking to all my all my guests. Okay. And again, these are kind of hard philosophical questions, but whatever comes to mind, no right or wrong answers. Um, so the first question is, uh, the longest living species are cyanobacteria that are been going on for around two and a half billion years. Um, and just for point of reference, the oldest standing human structure is just a few thousand years. So how do you see human development feasible from, from that perspective? Is this even feasible that we can think of us as species going on for such a long period of time? That's an interesting question because, I mean, I just fall back on my evolutionary biology, I guess, and to say, have we not also evolved from the same stock as our cyanobacteria? Like if we go all the way back um, to the, the ooze or like <laughs> the primordial ooze, didn't we all emerge together and then start to deviate from ourselves in the grand tree of life? So I think once again, like if we just think about like, maybe it's not the society that we see ourselves today where we're sitting in these houses with our laptops in front of us, but the creativity of human consciousness, if that is able to be um, propagated forward into time, I think that would be like, that's what I want to see. Um, if our bodies change, if our societies change, if all of, if everything that we think is, um, you know, solid and rigid today, if that all changes, but what I want to be left is the creativity and um, compassion of humanity. Like if, as long as that in some way is being, um, is being propagated and generated and can be identified in some time in the future, like I think that I would be happy and proud to have been existing on this in this earth at this time and super inspiring that's your amazing amazing answer thank you so much uh the second one um how important is failure for human discovery and and overall you know human life failure yeah it's a, that's a fantastic question and like really like we fail so much more than we succeed but we somehow place more emphasis on our successes than on our failures because we learn, we can learn from failures, but it's it's challenging to learn from a success. If if you're always succeeding in life, like I don't know, I don't know if you can always succeed in life. Um, so yeah, I think fa failures are, signif are significantly more important than successes, um, which I guess is a bit interesting <laughs> as well. Now I think about it, because we want to be successful in our in, like in our in our goal to achieve achieve like a truly sustainable world. And if we fail at that, like that's not great. But actually, maybe let's think about it like this. So for an answer to be right, every single component of that answer has to be like correct. But for an answer to be wrong, you only need one of those components to be like to be wrong. So like, it's just interesting, you know, and we think about, for example, um, you know, like let's just take an example of compostable plastics. When we compare compostable plastics to traditional plastics, like they, they're right in so many things like, okay, they can be bio-based, which is great. They can be made from waste resources rather than primary agricultural feedstocks. That's great. But when we get to like a single wrong piece or something which doesn't work, the entire thing is thrown out. Like, oh, okay, compost facilities won't actually take those materials. Yeah. Oh, well, like they're terrible. Let's just throw the whole thing out. But when we look at, but we don't paint conventional plastics in the same light. 
And it's just really interesting, like to get to true sustainability, it's not about getting every single aspect of that correct the first time. It's like, okay, let's try to get 50% of them right. And then like take that 50% of correctness, look at the 50% that were wrong and try to modify those. And then we take another 50% of that. And we, can, we need to build upon our successes as well as building upon our failures to actually get to the sustainable system. And so I get a bit frustrated as well with our binary system of just like good and bad, right and wrong, yes and no. It's not just about that initial gut reaction. We have to really take the time and be brave enough to break apart those, those concepts and those ideas to get to the crux of things and really to try to extract what is the best part of that. And if it's not a good part, how can we make it good? And how can we continue on this, you know, on this progression to goodness? Um, because there is, as I said, like these, their extremes exist, but we're constantly fluctuating between them. And so we have to think about and recognize that it may not be 100% perfect, but anything less than 0% is actually better. That's my yeah. thoughts. <laughs> I, I completely, I completely <laughs> agree. No, it's, it's the idea of the process, not, not, mm -hmm. not just the end result. Yeah. And that brings me back, back memories of, for example, my driving test. Oh, I yeah. was doing great at the very last one error long and that's it i had to do yeah. the whole thing all over again it was frustrating anyway last question <laughs> um so describe for us the future of your choosing uh, you can pick 100 years from now 1000 or 10,000 years from now what what would you like to see how do you imagine this planet us life to be yeah um I've come to realize that trying to imagine what a global system will look like in the future is probably outside my purview because there's just so much I can't control. And I feel like the more that I try to, you know, be that person who's going to change the world, the more I'm going to just get kind of stressed and bottled up into this like ball of anxiety, essentially. So for me, I'm going to talk about what I hope to see at the end of my days, at least, like what I'm striving towards, perhaps. So what I think I want for myself is to, I want to live in a cooperative community. So I want to live in a, a community of friends and family and acquaintances who work together to achieve the goals of our community. And I think those goals are just to be, to live a happy and healthy and fulfilling life. So I want to be able to co contribute to a community that self-governs itself, that's able to create its own food and resources, that's able to connect with other communities in a positive and uh, amplifying way. Like that's really what I want to be part of um, at the end of my days, which may be 10 years or maybe 50, depending on how we turn things around. But that's, that's, what, that's the world that I work towards, at least something where we it's just fully cooperative. There's no necessary need for explosive growth we can grow within the limits of our community and i think that's what i that's what i'm really striving towards excellent excellent first uh first of our guest that is not not really focusing on time but in the essence um because it's is is that the point you no know, of of what is essential no matter if it's if it's a hundred years from now or a thousand or ten thousand years from now um so yeah, many, many, many ideas, super inspiring conversation. I, I have no words to thank you. It was really, really amazing. So with this, this is it. We, we finished. Um, again, thank you. Thank you so, so much. No, my pleasure. It was so much fun to have these conversations. It's actually been a while since I've thought about chemistry in this way, but um, I thought about it so much in graduate school from this perspective. But now that I'm a business owner in industry, there's so much other stuff to think about. So I really appreciate the opportunity to chat about like these fundamental ideas. Oh, excellent. I'll, I'll, I'll try to repeat this at some point because yeah, it's, 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 it's necessary from time to time. Okay, Definitely. thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. As always, I would like to finish with just a few reflections. Um, Dr. Chile was, was really fantastic. I hope you enjoy it um, as much as I did. I um, particularly found interesting the idea of homeostasis, uh, this idea of, of um, a balance. Um, so homeostasis in biology is the self-regulating process by which uh, biological systems maintain stability and adjusting at the same time to changing on the external conditions. 
in their environment um is is quite inspiring to 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 think how we can take this idea of homeostasis and apply it to other things um i i just imagine for example to economics I did a little bit of research and I found already a paper from the 1950s thinking on how to inspire um, the study of the economics, of a new economics uh, based on homeostasis. It's, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, the, other, the other point that she did very eloquently was explaining entropy and the idea that we actually have to learn how to manage it, uh, which is what nature does. So she very, very nicely explained that basically waste is, is just humans being lazy, not, not taking care of, of that high level entropy that, that we produce. And it made me remember that I, I wrote a piece in 2013 for the Royal Society of the Arts, the RSA. Uh, they had a project called Great, uh, Great Recovery. I, I wrote something that I, I named the science behind uh, circular economy, and I was focusing on thermodynamics. This was while I was doing my PhD. Uh, obviously, Dr. Chile makes a much better job explaining explaining this this idea. And the other point is the subsidies, uh, this vicious circle of dependence that we have created, and how is is really hard to break from it from it and. Any, any designer will tell you that as soon as we propose to our client to use a more sustainable material, the, the question is always, oh, it's going to cost me more? And normally the answer is yes. So we, we have the, the, the knowledge and we have the materials and the processes, but it all normally comes down to an economic decision. And lastly, I met uh, Dr. Chile several years ago, and I have had the pleasure to chat with her, mostly about projects and technical issues. This is the first time that I have a conversation like this with her, and it was amazing. She's, she's truly magic. Um, the poetry and the way that she expresses herself is beautiful beyond what I can explain here. Uh, these ideas she had, she shared with us about how we limit ourselves and how are we our biggest limit. She, she did a magnificent job. And the idea of breaking our paradigms and, and design the world we, we want to live in is, is um, precisely the idea of, so, of this podcast, no? is, is to understand how everything that we have created, we humans, is not a given. And we are in power. We can decide and we can change things. Uh, we, need, we need to work on uh, cooperation. We need to take care we, of each other. We need, we need to be empathic. But we can do it. We can, we can get out of these problems we have. We end with a very nice uh, message, a very positive message from Dr. Chile. I hope you like it. There are more interviews coming. So please um, don't forget to subscribe and... Thank you very much for joining us. Future Exploration is produced and written by me, Victor Martinez. Music is composed by Rafael Crux, Uda Lugo, and Mauro and Daniel Martinez. Future Exploration is licensed under the Creative Commons with attribution and non-commercial use.